get your kicks by removing love from a natural trip. But metal will rust and money will burn. Yeah. And on the final page, I ask, I ask, were you living in the green world? And did you give some in return? Any project that goes through that the Forest Service puts out, you know, predominantly timber sales and as we're going to see today, uh, bike park proposals, uh, BART goes out and monitors. So yeah, um, like Carla was saying, we go through, we read the environmental assessment, which is uh, generally a lengthy document that says, this is the proposal, um, you know, this is why we want to do it, and these are the environmental ramifications of putting this through. Um, we read through those documents and then we go experience the place on the ground and see if uh, truth mesh or uh, reality meshes with what they're presenting. Um, and Bark is a, uh, we're a nonprofit. We're about two thirds supported by the community right now. So it's all private donations. Um, and yeah, we're just a watchdog group that monitors um, all the forests of Mount Hood and the surrounding BLM forests. Is all that process that you mentioned hold true for this particular project since it's not a timber sale? Well, we will see today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're out here. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard about the proposal that the timber line has put together to um, create a mount downhill mountain bike park with the lift assisted access. So what that means is they will use the existing uh, Jeff's, Jeff's flood, which I think is the main one over there, um, to bring mountain bikers up the hills. And th this is actually the top of the, the proposal area. Um, so then the uh, cyclists will mountain bike down the trails and then get lifted up. Um, so the trails won't go any higher than here then? Right. And it's, um, they're proposing about 17, 15 to 17 miles of trails with um, about 13 acres affected, but that's actually several hundred that are indirectly affected um, in this area. So we're not going to be able to see all of it today, obviously. But um, we are going to go down and look at one um, mountain bike trail that is existing that goes to, this is what I believe from what I've seen, uh, goes to government camp and then goes into town on a couple of different trails. So um, we'll walk that and then we can go see some flagged areas of another trail and then go see a beautiful area over in the zigzag canyon. So. Um, so they're not setting this up for people to bike any way but downhill. Or... Downhill, yep. And there's actually going to be a skills park. So you saw the day lodge, which is below the actual um, stay lodge. And uh, there will be a skills park where they'll have like bridges and different technical skills that are required in downhill biking. Um, so you can practice and that's just below the lodge and then there'll be actual different levels of um, skills, trails, so throughout the area. Um, this is a scoping map. So the project has been um, 
they're, they proposed it to the Forest Service and then they do the environmental assessment and then they release that to the public to comment on. Is that, mm -hmm. is that the process? So um, comments closed in April. So now they're going back through the comments and trying to reassess what people you know, brought th to their attention and um, figure out if the, pro the proposal can go through. So I think they're estimating a, release, a decision release in the next few months. So, so the Forest Service makes that decision? Yes. So. Did Bart submit comments? Mm -hmm. Yes, th they um, submitted comments with Friends of Mount Hood and a couple other organizations. Friends of Mount Hood, uh, the Native Plant Society, there's Mazamas, which is an alpine tracking and ski club. Yeah. Um, and I apologize to the other groups I'm forgetting. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but there was about six or seven different groups. The Sierra okay. Club. They listed on the website? That. Yeah, they are all listed on the website. And Bark does, we threw up every, you know, every comment that we submit to the Forest Service, we, we put it up on the website. So if you wanted to read more into this project, like uh, the scoping notice is up there, as well as the maps that Carla has. Mm -hmm. um, and then they released their preliminary assessment. And then our comments in response to both of those documents are all on the website. A lot of the concerns had to do with the um, fragile alpine area that this is in and the impacts that um, new construction of trails would cause as well as you know the continuous continuous mountain bike um, impacts and you know they are using the existing lift but they do have to construct the skills park and the 17 so miles of trail um, which is you know they're proposing um, between three to six feet of trail but that's just the tread and so if you have seen trails before there's a down slope a back slope and then the whole you know trail clearing that needs to be cut so you're looking at more you know if it's a six foot tread maybe 10 feet of clear area um, that would be all through the trails that require the six foot um, tread so it's not just that narrow um, three feet six feet tread of trail. Um, and then you've got the issues of soil erosion and um, going into the watershed and all that. Uh, and they were proposing using mini excavators to do a lot of the work. So you also have that heavy machinery and trail crews up here doing all that trail work. So. What type of traffic do they project to be on these trails or do they yet? Uh, they didn't, I didn't see a number but there was a comment about Whistler, which they're kind of modeling this um, park after Whistler, BC has a downhill um, park, and they get up to 120,000 visitors in their summer season. That's in like what, four months or something? Uh, I think so. And this they're one, yeah, this one's only operational for three months. Yeah, Whistler, it's the same. I suspect would be a little bit shorter of a window, a yeah. further north. But. It's probably approximately 90 days. As well. So you're talking 90 days then. Yeah. And so they definitely get more visitors in the in the winter time up here, but there are quite a few people around, as you can see today. And so imagine, you know, that many more up here. A lot of them on mountain bikes. So, and that's a concern. That was a, a concern in some of the comments was the traffic and the noise that it would bring up to the the lodge and the impacts of the feel, the historical landmark that this lodge is. So, so they would be parking at a government camp and taking the lift up? Um, they propose using the parking lot here. Because there is already a similar thing uh, at Ski Bowl, just across the road there, uh, which isn't operating at capacity at this point. Um, so, and even in the environmental assessment, it mentioned like basically what they felt they would be doing is probably just diverting all the folks from Ski Bowl up here. Mm -hmm. um, and basically just, you know, probably just creating 50% at each of those places. Um, because it is kind of a niche sport. It's not, you know, something that everybody goes out and does. Um, so, you know, the idea is that eventually maybe they would draw in people from, from outside this region. Um, but the environmental assessment didn't really speak to that, like what the projections would be of those numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and whether it'd be worth doing all this work for, you know, what could be a small amount of people um, that's just taking business from the adjacent ski park. They, there was um, the proposal to use the park as, for pro races as well, so um, I think they proposed having 
two a month, I've read somewhere, so that would be part of the the use of the park um, if it would be built. So again, they modeled that off of, of Whistler, and I think they had several in this, their summer season. So it's not, it wouldn't be just for, you know, people coming from different areas for recreational. What has been the effects <laughs> out, at, up at Whistler? If that's been going for a few years. Has there been some some environmental damage? Has there been I couldn't find a whole lot on, you know, any controversy or, you know, impact that it might have. It was a lot of um, positive feedback. Famous hydrologist in, our, er, hydrologist in our area named John Rhodes who wrote extensive comments on it about about exactly those effects of uh, erosion and sedimentation and so forth um, and about there being listed fish, just um, cutthroat trout are in the immediate vicinity of where this proposal is. Um, and then just downstream from here there are Chinook and coho salmon mm -hmm. as well as steelhead. Um, and so you know, the bikes are going to be coming down this trail pretty quick, 25, 30 miles an hour, and taking hairpin turns, which is going to kick up a bit of dust. Mm -hmm. um, there's 24 crossings of Still Creek, where this um, trail crosses Still Creek. So that's going to be a lot of sources for sediment to dump into that stream. Um, and we're going to see more of that today, and we can probably see more how, you know, kind of imagining more of how that water would flow down and speak more to that, how this would affect sand. Um, and then this, this area, too, is also um, summer range for elk. So elk come up in this area and use this um, for forage in the summertime and also as calving grounds. So they bring the youngsters up here too. Um, and I really doubt they're going to be up here <laughs> hanging out if there's bikes coming down 20 miles an hour. So, um, And mom, you know, her instinct is when she's freaked out is to run and baby can't keep up. So um, in other places where these have happened, there's often separation between mom and calf. Um, another concern that was um, brought up is, you know, a lot of the issue of mountain biking around the forest is um, user-made trails. They're not following the existing trails already. And so, you know, what's to prevent that from happening here as well as just going uphill or straight downhill and not following the trail? And when I was out here three weeks ago on the trail that went to government camp, it looked fairly newly um, maintained and built, but yet there were some um, bike tire trails going off the trail, creating a little bit of braiding, which is, you know, a trail that exists and then a trail right next to it for different reasons. So, um, and that causes more erosion and more problems, and then you have to go back and redesign. So, um, if, a, if a trail is properly designed from the start to sustain itself, which, you know, is, is very difficult to do, um, to to read all the, you know the slope of the land to get correctly get the uh, you know movement of water through the the hill and through the trail and everything so you know a lot of bikers also just veer off and, and don't want to go through a certain part of the trail they want to make it more fun go straight downhill and that's part of the issues that they're facing and they were kind of claiming this park as a resolution to some of those issues as well. So, that bark is not like anti-recreation or anything. Um, you know, um, we just don't feel that this is the right place. Uh, there is a lot of road closing going on. You know, in the Kalawash uh, watershed, they're considering closing like hundreds of miles of roads, which is awesome, and we really support. And um, Lori Ann, our campaign manager, has been promoting the idea of creating um, some of these roads into trail, the road to trail conversions and having like this ma massive network of bike trails with like primitive campsites scattered throughout so that people could go out and just take off on their bike for a few days and um, set up camp at these various spots like in the Kalawash watershed. Um, and this, you know, this would be a way that we could create biking opportunities up here but use existing framework and not be re recreating something um, that's already out there um, in a really, really fragile environment.
this map does not really give you a lot of information. No, it doesn't. So if you look at it, it's an uh, over aerial view, and it's just, you know, exaggerate it with, obviously, to, to show, but it's in such preliminary stages that it's not terribly detailed, so it's a little difficult to see. So they really haven't made these designs for the trails yet until they get the okay. Right, right. But, I mean, they should be flagged so that you can follow the route, you know, and, and actually assess properly. And there was flagging down below, like I said, so I followed that a little bit when I was out here a few weeks ago. Well, they were proposing that it would start this summer. Um, but I believe they had to go back and reassess everything after the comment period that ended in April. Um, and so it's kind of up in the air now, but they were low, the next dead, uh, date that they put out was wanting to be done in, at the end of summer 2012, so then it would open in 13. So. Yeah, that was the plan, and then that they would construct it next year, and then this would be open 2013. But that's um, if then nobody challenges them. Yet. Right, and that's, ra that's what's... The big holdup right now is because there was the hydrologist, John Rhodes, who wrote comments talking specifically to the hydrological issues and the sedimentary issues from this project, um, which is causing the Forest Service to basically go back and do a lot of their work. Um, another thing that was that was under-analyzed and that was like wildlife habitat. Um, you know, like I said earlier with elk, you know, elk use this for forage in the summer. Um, also, what I, what I keep noticing around here is there's a lot of like what they call snags, which basically means standing dead trees. Um, but in forestry, or in the case when they're near trails, they call them hazard trails. Um, so, but standing dead trees, snags, are really awesome for wildlife. It's something like a third of all bird species use them for homes, and mammals, it's about 25%. So, snags are vital for habitat, but because it's a standing dead tree, not so safe for a cyclist tearing through. So those are often felled and just left on the ground. So we lose that key component to habitat up here because of this. What about uh, public comment? Would, is there a time limit for public comment? There, there is. There's the first period that goes is called the scoping period, and the, and that's kind of when the like that's the big generic like we want to do something here. What do you think? And the the public can comment at that point, and then you can comment when the environmental assessment comes out, which is the more nitty gritty like hundred some page document that goes through the environmental effects, and the public can comment at that period too. Um, so you're saying we still have about a year to go before they finalize a plan, and so the public can still uh, provide some comments or questions about this. We're past that official comment period, but I would encourage folks to do so if if they feel mm -hmm. that anyway. Because we didn't, I didn't even know about it. So yeah, most yeah. times that's what really happens. You don't know about what the government and and uh, you know companies and contractors. Yeah, want. and there is confusion. They they release this as what's called the preliminary assessment, and sometimes if a preliminary assessment has enough. Uh, weakness to it. Sometimes they have to go back and do an environmental assessment, which is a more detailed document. So if they release an environmental assessment as their next step, then the public will have another 30-day uh, window to comment mm -hmm. on it. Okay. If they release what's called a decision notice, which is the Forest Service saying, this is the final, you know, we're done. This is the final project. At that point, you, the public can't comment on it. Mm -hmm. Unless they comment at earlier stages. Oh man, so we're, we're lost out for being part of the the governing pro process. Then, De depending on what their next step is, depending on if they release an environmental so we're assessment. Preliminary. If we can have an environmental assessment, we might have another 30-day window. That's, Otherwise, yeah. we're pretty well shut out of luck until we have enough people commenting on it. Yeah. Or, in, or interest, or public interest. In it. Yeah. It says something to me about the Forest Service that they would try to get by with something like this in such a delicate area with a preliminary assessment. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that seem like something like this in high altitude with such erosive soils and all that that they would automatically go to? Something a little bit more? I would think so. Yeah, but that's kind of the way things have been. They've been scaled back. Um, and you know, like everything, the Forest Service's staff is getting cut dramatic, drastically. So they're trying to, you know, ramp things through as quick as they can or, you know, uh, using less labor hours than they can. So, yeah, it happens sometimes that the analysis is a little shoddier. A lot of the pub public is in favor of more, you know, trails and more advanced, um, professionally maintained um, trails in the forest. So, although there are quite a few available trails for mountain bikers in the area. So. Lower down. Lower down, yeah. The park would be owned by Timberline, so they would contract out to, to build and maintain. Um, 
I did read that they were hoping for volunteers to patrol and uh, make sure that the rules were followed on, on the trails themselves um, by the cyclists. Oregon, I think, is the biggest um, area or the most the area with the biggest um, availability, I don't know the word I'm looking for, of mountain biking trails. Um, and there, uh, the Ski Bowl has a park, and I believe there's one outside of Bend or Sisters, um, another park. So there's quite a few areas, you know, within a reasonable amount of time from Portland to, to have such a, you know, different level of um, skills that you can go to in just one concentrated area. Um, it's not that bark is against mountain biking and recreational use of the, the forest, but this particular area is so fragile and there's other opportunities to have such um, a, a park or, you know, spend the, the resources to um, better improve areas and use road, decommissioned roads as, as trails. Well, so if we're only leasing to here, how come there's going to be trails further down? Well, they're all within the boundary on the on the proposed map. Um, this again is the existing. What I think is the existing. Oh, so you're talking? This is the the extent west. Yes, west. But they still they, they, they go a lot further down. Oh, okay, that's yeah. that's what I was confused. Yeah, about. and most of them kind of zigzag and and do their thing or and there's on the map you can see one that kind of goes straight down um, those red lines are the trails the red lines are the ski lifts that are existing oh, okay yeah so this is the Jeff flood one that we went under um, that is the the only lift that we'll be using and the trails are in white and the the proposed trails are these different colors so the blue the black and the green mm, all right um, the white, I believe, is just from the, the aerial view of... That might be where we're standing, is one of them white. Yeah. Existing here. So how many miles of trails are in this area right now? <coughs> right now? Yeah. I believe only this one um, that I'm aware of. And um, this kind of traverses back and forth through Timberline's property? Um, we're, we're out of Timberline's property right now. And we're still on National Forest, and it goes through to government camp. Um, there's a lot of hiking trails. The Pacific Crest Trail um, will actually make our way up to, um, and that's the one that goes from California to Canada. But um, So there's a few hiking trails in the area, but as far as I know, this is the only mountain bike trail that exists in within this area. Because so. um, you see it a lot where you project looks good on paper and then you know like well timber sales anyways you hand that off to a private contractor the pri private contractor implements it but their motif is to make money and it doesn't it doesn't mesh up with how it should have looked through the timber sale contract um, so really trying to explore like well first how do we monitor that and then how do we make changes on the field um, because it's difficult I mean it's just they just auction it off highest bidder gets to log so the forest service don't have a whole lot of follow-up either on, no, mo on most well, of their projects no. yeah they have a sale administrator that comes in, and it's like twice a week they'll come in and pop in to see how things are going. But um, you don't have like soil specialists, and those people just don't come. Those people, the specialists that are really going to know, uh, be able to see those major impacts firsthand, don't come in until it's all done and through. And then afterwards, they, do they follow up, Forest Service follow up on how it's impacting the land, you know, on the ground after after it's been done? Supposedly. I mean, supposedly that would be the time when specialists would come in and go like, oh, yeah, this project is 
wiped out all the snags. Let's see what we can do to create some snags or, um, you know, uh, wildlife biologists might come in and, you know, look for different ways of making habitat or fisheries might come in and look for different ways of improving things on the ground for fish. So um, the specialists come in at that point and try and make it better. But, yeah. They have funds for that then. Well, it's just like the, this is the part where I laugh more. <laughs> yeah, just like Sorry. the dams that they put in uh, in all these wild rivers around here, they're now taking them out because they're finding out that uh, they want the salmon to go, you know, as far as they can to the headwaters. And uh, but those dams have been in existence now for what 80, 90 years or something like that. And yeah. now they're taking part because they realized it at the first they probably didn't have any salmon impact studies because it just wasn't thought of. Yeah. Now all the damage has been done. Yeah. For 50, 60, 70 years. Now, do we want that to happen with bike trails? Subbing is the timber sale planner and the recreation planner. And, like, <laughs> the botanist is now also doing wildlife. And they're doing it in two districts where they were just had one of those jobs in one district. So, um, you know, that makes it harder. And, you know, I guess to give them a little bit of credit, you know. Most of the people that become wildlife biologists don't do so because they hate animals, you know. But um, <laughs> but they have a really hard job now because they're usually a wildlife biologist and they're doing soils and they're doing recreation and they're doing it in two districts. And so whereas before they would just do it in one. So. Is there anything written into into the uh, contract that the that the uh, whatever corporation is involved in this has to supply some kind of trail maintenance revenue of any kind? I'm not sure how that all teases out. Um, yeah, because if, if it isn't in the contract, they won't do it. Yeah, and I'm sure, I'm sure that there is to some extent. I mean, you know, there's there's some, you know, uh, environmental obligations that uh, was it RLK or whatever it is the corporation that runs Timberline has to do for for being on this land. Yeah, but I don't. Yeah, I don't know all the specifics of that. I don't know if that would come out until um you know some of the more of the contractual stuff starts to right. emerge well after the decision notice and so and the forest service would have to have the funds to to watch that too yeah right mm -hmm.